Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. Today, we're honored to be sitting down and speaking with Brampton Regional Councilor Rowena Santos. From a settlement in the early 1800s to an officially designated city in 1974, Brampton has officially grown into a dynamic and vibrant city with a proud past and bright future. Brampton is Canada's ninth largest city and is the fastest growing of Canada's largest 25 cities. Brampton is located northwest of Toronto within close proximity of Toronto's Pearson International Airport. Offering more than 9,000 acres of parkland, Brampton is a green city providing access to more than 850 parks, many recreational amenities, open spaces, and trails. So stay tuned and we'll be right back after a quick message with cross-border interviews featuring Brampton Regional Councillor Rowena Santos. Are you passionate about local governance and municipal issues? Do you believe in the power of community-driven conversations? Then join us at the Cross Border Network, where we bring together voices from across Canada to shine a spotlight on the challenges and the triumphs of our municipalities. But we need your support to keep the conversation going. Visit crossborderinterviews.ca today to show your support by backing the show monthly or making a one-time annual donation. Your contribution will help us grow and expand our reach, bringing important stories to even more listeners across the nation. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can amplify the voices of local communities. Together, we can shape a brighter future for all. Cross Border Network, where local matters and your support counts. Visit us today at crossborderinterviews.ca. Councillor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. It's always a pleasure to sit down with municipal leaders from across this great country and talk about their community and their duty to serve. And I want to start there. I want to ask a simple question, but an overarching one. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Rowena? You know, it, it's um, really driven by this passion I've always had in any career I've had been in, whether that's in the corporate sector, the nonprofit sector, or in the public sector, you know, before being elected myself, I've always been having this sense in my gut of wanting to do more for the community and really wanting to make a difference. And um, that always resonates with me, even as an elected official now, it's graduation season right now. And I have the honor of, you know, addressing graduating classes and the future of, of, of Brampton and our young people. And it's, you know, it's really driven by making a difference, particularly for those young people in the city of Brampton. You, I, I looked through your sort of quote unquote official resume, by, aka LinkedIn and your biography. It seems, and I don't take any offense to this, but you could have gone provincially, you could have chosen federal to start your political career. But in 2018, you chose municipal to get involved. Mm -hmm. What was it about the allure of the municipal sector that said, if I want to give back to my community, I want to get involved municipally, it's where is that? Yeah, it's um for me, you know, be, before being elected municipally as a councillor in Brampton, I worked as a staff person at Queen's Park for 13 years and uh, was exposed to partisan politics in, in Queen's Park and at the provincial legislature. So I had the privilege of electing other people, managing other campaigns, organizing for other candidates, helping a party reach historic numbers when it came to number of women elected and number of people of color who were elected. And, and I was super proud in 2018 to do that. But what I was also aware of is that the municipal government is the government that is closest to the people, the closest to the people. They are the ones who residents call when they have an issue, regardless of whether or not it's within our jurisdiction to do so municipally, they still call their councillor or their mayor. And I love that. I love being, um, I love helping startups. I love helping to solve problems, uh, whether it's in our jurisdiction or not. Um, and, and so the municipal level of government for me was really um, about a sense of, calling to serve people directly uh, and and being closer to home. Obviously, I'm, I'm fortunate enough now to live only about 
a five minute bike ride away from city hall. Um, <laughs> so that makes it, that makes it a very enticing as well, but really Chris, it's the government that is closest to the people and who can actually get things done for folks on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay. So this is going to sound very strange, but I think I know you. I think we've worked together. Did you work for the McGinty Liberals? No, I did not. I did not, but I was there at the time, Chris. I actually worked with the Ontario NDP. Okay, so did you work in the agriculture department? Did you work for Hampton? No, I, I, I yes. Yes, okay. I did. I worked for Leon Dombrowski. Oh, agriculture. but that's where we probably crossed paths. <laughs> that's, I, I'm like, how do I know? You, you're, okay, anyway, I apologize. I apologize. We're getting <laughs> off on a tangent there. There we go. There's tangent done over with. Um, so in 2018, you decide to put your name on the ballot for counselor. Because in 2022, you go for regional counselor because there's different layers of counselors in the city Correct. of Brampton. I can imagine you do it in a sense of giving back to your community, but you make history in the city of Brampton as well, mm -hmm. being the first Filipino woman elected to city council. Prior to putting your name on the ballot, had you considered that was going to be your sort of entrance into politics of sort of breaking a glass barrier yeah i and um and you know the the filipino community who of which i'm so proud mabuhay filipinas uh, such a proud filipino i am it's it's such a growing community here in the region of peel and the city of brampton and um did i know that i'd be breaking glass ceilings um, maybe I was aware because I, I've always been part of candidate search processes in the at the provincial level and the federal level as well. Um, but that's uh, been part of the motivation is because I always actually the challenge and sometimes being the first, whether that's the first Filipino elected, first Filipino woman elected in 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 the area or Branton being the first on many different things and many different files that I have led now that I'm elected. Um, I love doing that. And, and representation matters. Um, and so fundamental to me is making sure that young women, uh, women of color, Filipinos, that they see that representation in government. And you asked the question earlier about, you know, why municipal politics, blah, blah, blah. Well, yeah, municipal politics is the, is the closest to the people, but also it's an opportunity for people like myself and other trailblazers to really shine. And, and it's an opportunity to show what we can do in our role. Our role it, it does, is not what confines us or limits us in terms of what we can or cannot do. There have been many files that I have championed that have reached the FCM floor just a few weeks ago over the years that aren't necessarily the jurisdiction or the mandate of municipal government, but have a direct impact on the residents that we serve every single day. And so for me as a woman, as a woman of color, as a Filipino, yes, broken glass ceilings, and like so many other women as well throughout, throughout the entire country, for me, it's been a matter of what we do with that. Like, how do we use that as our strength in order to make some real changes? Because people are paying attention to what I say. People are paying attention to the mistakes that I might make, or people are paying attention to the motions that I bring forward. So if that's already there as a trailblazer in this elected role, what is the opportunity to cause more change? Is that a double-edged sword though? Because I can imagine when people are watching you, putting you under that microscope, it, it can be daunting because every mistake you mis make, and I'm not saying you make mistakes, I'm saying that everything you fumble or potentially drop the ball on, people will pick up on. So I've got to ask, uh, it's a weird question, but I think I need to ask it this way. Are you harder on yourself in those situations or do you think the people are harder on you? Yeah. So I think that, um, you know, the, I think sometimes the people are misinformed um, and certainly in an area like in Brampton, where we don't have much media coverage, 
uh, we, like a local paper or anything like that, uh, folks get their media or what's happening in Brampton through social media. And we all know how easy it is to misinform or have disinformation out in the public or to spin things a certain way or remove things out of context in order to further other goals. And so I think the level of misinformation is really what is the challenge for us as a, as a woman, as, as a woman in, in, in office and a Filipino woman of color. Quite honestly, Chris, I my whole entire career I've had no choice and I and I am happy to do so work very, very hard, <laughs> like two to three times as hard to bring those ideas forward, to cause them into action, and usually get very little credit for it. So my baseline is to do everything I can to solve problems and to deal with things. And you're right, because of that level of action and that level of attention in this role, unfortunately, I become a target. And uh, it got so bad this past year where I was receiving death threats and, you know, people who were sharing where I live um, publicly on social media, threats to my son. Um, I had to have security uh, follow me around at one point. I've made many reports to police about the level of harassment that I've received and brought that very publicly forward at FCM where we took action at FCM and, and passed a motion for all levels of government to deal with the unfortunate harassment and misinformation related to local politicians. Just on a side tangent before I ask my next question, your speech at FCM brought uh, into my perspective what I can do on my show of elevating those stories about the abuse. I recently had the pleasure of speaking to uh, the city of Greater Sudbury Councillor Natalie LeBay about her ordeal mm -hmm. with abuse and someone uh, stalking her and showing up at her house um, later on next month in July when we're recording this in June and July we have three round tables around abuse because of your speech so I want to thank you mm -hmm. so much for bringing that forward because I think it's an important thing that we need to talk about but we're not here to talk about that we're here to That's talk okay. about you and we're here to talk about the tough decisions you have to make around that council table because the people have elected you to make the tough choices. And I can imagine in today's economic world where things are getting tighter and tighter for a lot of people, those decisions at that council table are not getting easier if they're probably getting a lot harder. For you, how do you make that decision in the best interest for the entire city of Brampton? Because when you're elected, you're not just elected as a regional councillor, you're elected as a at Brampton councillor, a representative of the entire city. So you have to make a best interest, a decision best uh, based on the best interest of the entire community. So for you, how do you make those tough choices? Oh, it's so tough, Chris. And Brampton is such an interesting place to be making uh, tough decisions and, to, that decisions and also problem solving and finding that balance. This year, 2024, Brampton is turning 50 years old as a city. So what does that mean? If only 15, 50, 50 golden years ago, Brampton was only a town. And it was only, you know, in, you know, 50 years ago that we became a city. And now, 50 years later, we are Canada's fastest growing large city in the entire country. And we have an underreported population. And we speak over 175 different languages with over 250 different cultures. And so in that whole incredible vibrancy and dynamic situation of Brampton, you could imagine it's very difficult to make decisions around intensification, around active transportation and sustainability decisions when our road system and infrastructure was really designed on the premise of a suburban town and community. And now we're sticking in about hundreds of thousands of people and trying to figure out where to put in condos and, you know, a transit line and active transportation because there's not enough room for cars. And so I'm experiencing this right now as um, in, you know, in 2019, for example, we approved an active transportation master plan 
And it's all fine and dandy when it's on paper, everyone agrees. But once they start implementing it and taking some of those roads away from cars, that is a trigger point for, oh my gosh, something is changing. The driving culture is changing. I'm getting parking tickets for parking in front of my house where there's now a bike lane, or I now have to share the road and maybe it takes an extra two to three minutes to get home because there's a bike lane in the way. So these challenges are very real. Now, how, how do I make these decisions? I, I always go by my principles and, and, and what the future looks like. And I go back to the graduating classes that are graduating this year in June. And I always say to them, listen, I will always make time for young people because the decisions that we make at the council table today are really gonna impact you the most they will 100% impact you the most. And so the I, I look at what we committed to it in Brampton, which is the Active Transportation Master Plan. We decided that a long time ago. We declared a climate emergency. We declared a healthcare emergency. We declared that there's a housing crisis in the region of Kiel. And if we are saying as council that there are these very pressing issues that need to be resolved and our decisions must for the sake of those students who are graduating this month they must be based on those uh, principles how do i balance that with some of the nimbys or with some of the folks who are reluctant to change or not willing to give up the two to three minutes extra to get home because there's a bike lane for example a lot of conversations, a lot is, of one-to-one -one conversations. Is it important for you? Because even in the first 15 minutes of our conversation so far, I get a sense that you're willing to have conversations with people. You're willing to have respectful conversations. I want to preface that because I think there's a respectful conversation and then there's a just calm down and then we'll have a conversation yeah. later on. Is it important for yourself when making those tough decisions to listen to both sides because in today's age where we're on social media and we're in our social echo chambers where we hang out with people that agree with us we talk to people that agree with us as counselors you represent people who voted for you and who voted against you and therefore you have mm -hmm. to listen to the other side of every issue because you have to make the best interest because hypothetically if 80% of your city says this is the way we want and your belief says maybe I want to see it this way and the city says something else, maybe I should actually understand why they want that and it may change my mind. For you, is it important to hear all sides of every issue no matter what, how contentious it is? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and we had, I'll give you an example. We had, uh, a very, we had our downtown is completely changing where there's a go train station. It's a tra major transit station area. There's tons of intensification and condos that are currently in the application process. At the same time, it's in a community, an existing residential community where some folks have been living in their single detached homes for the past 30, 40 years. And there, you know, many of them are like, what's happening to my downtown? Well, we're building more housing. And unfortunately, there is a, a lot of um, uh, misunderstanding and, and resistance to change. And so they we suggested that we have the applicant host a meeting so that the residents, an extra meeting, so that the residents can actually uh, get to know the applicant more and make suggestions. I attended that meeting. I attended that meeting <laughs> for the love of this community. I attended that meeting and I got, you know, <laughs> I got questioned, berated. I got yelled at, I got blamed. Um, but I had those tough conversations. We came to some resolution at the end with the residents that we're going to have a broader meeting in September to give them an overview and a bigger picture versus application by application so that then they can make informed decisions on what they want to do with their property, whether they want to stay or whether they want to go. So what I've learned is when implementing some of these things that are causing no, like Brampton has no choice but to change. Let's be clear. We, we have no choice but to change or risk issues with encampments and homelessness, which quite frankly, I'm also dealing with. But 
having those conversations with folks. And at the very end of the night, I closed down, I closed down the community center, <laughs> not the bar, the community center, closed down with the last conversation. And because of those conversations, we established that we're going to have that meeting. We're going to be clearer about timelines. We're going to give them an overview. And that helps to relieve some of the anxiety and, and some of the, you know, the fear around what's going on. So I think having those conversations are important. The, the opposite is to just vote no to everything, but that's not going to help anyone. That's just going to de delay the inevitable and actually residents will lose control over having a say over what's happening. You talk about the contentious issues that Brampton has, and every municipality has its, its contentious issues, and I'm not saying Brampton's a, a unique in that situation. But the question I want to ask is, outside of those contentious issues, because I've watched a few City of Brampton council meetings, because that's what I do on a Saturday night, is watch council that's meetings fun. across... Exactly. And I, I get a sense that when there's a contentious issue in front of council, people show up, people want to be heard. But on average, I would say, and this is my personal opinion here, people are tuning out of what's going on at City Hall. They don't know mm -hmm. what truly is actually on the agenda package or the day-to-day -day workings of what the municipality does. In your role as regional councillor and before that as councillor, do you get a sense that there's an apathy about municipal politics or are people engaged enough in Brampton that if I walked down the street tomorrow and said what's on the agenda or what's going on in the city hall today they'd be able to answer that question yeah the uh, short answer is uh no <laughs> <laughs> I think I think folks uh, really start to pay attention when they see some of those decisions starting to be implemented in their neighborhood. Um, and despite uh, the public notices, despite the posts on social media, despite the you know drops in people's mailboxes, um, folks will always say, well, I didn't know you didn't tell us there was no consultation. Um, and so, so I guess the short answer is no. Now, what are we trying to do to, to help make it better? One of the things that we have done in Brampton is we are really working hard on getting our neighborhoods and various groups. Some of them are, 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 are already organically formed on WhatsApp groups or on the Nextdoor app or on Facebook groups. We're trying to officially form neighborhood associations that are affiliated with the city of Brampton, because then that gives us an actual channel to inform them of different things more proactively, preemptively beyond our traditional reach but actually connecting with people who are also connected to the other people in the very local, hyper-local neighborhoods. So we've been successful at trying to set up the neighborhood associations. And because of that, we're starting to see more levels of engagement. At the same time, there's tons of changes being implemented in the city of Brampton. And so people are very acutely aware depending on where the development applications are. <laughs> I want to turn to segment two because I'm cautious of time and I want to preface this line of questioning with the following. This is a conversation between the regional councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not a policy of council. This is her opinion and her opinion alone. It may match up with what uh, the city is talking about or even the region of Peel is talking about, but at the end of the day, this is her opinion. With that being said, Counselor, in your opinion, what do you believe is the biggest challenge or challenges facing the city of Brampton today as of ch oh, this recording? I, I would say housing, 100%. We have a very serious matter um, from my perspective related to housing in the city of Brampton. Uh, we have an underreported population with the huge number of international students that currently reside in Brampton in crowded basement apartments. Um, and uh, we, we've seen, I've experienced firsthand issues related to homelessness and encampments on top of an influx of asylum seekers uh, staying now in Peel Region and the city of Brampton. We don't have uh, enough housing in Brampton to accommodate the growth 
uh, that is coming to us. And we are trying very hard to not only catch up to that, to where we are now, um, but also plan for the future. So I know many municipalities might say that as well. Um, the other issue I would say is safety. Uh, safety in the city of Brampton, like any sort of growing, fast growing community with more people, uh, obviously comes more issues and more crime. One of the biggest issues that we've been dealing with for the past three, four years now since COVID actually is auto theft. And so we have seen Brampton on the main stage for in, in the recent past now with Mayor Patrick Brown really pushing on dealing with organized crime and auto theft as it relates to the federal government and those scanners at the borders, et cetera. So I would say that those two items, housing, absolutely, as well as uh, safety in particular, the auto theft issue have been the two top things as of today. So I want to play in the housing sandbox for a second here before we turn to the safety one. Um, you and I were both at FCM, our mutual friend, Scott Pierce, former president of FCM, now past president of FCM, said it best at the on the stage at FCM in Calgary. You don't want to see a mayor go build a house. You don't want to go. You don't want to <laughs> see Scott Pierce go build a house. And it's true. You, the role of a municipality is not to build houses. You're there to build the infrastructure and make the sort of environment friendly for developers to come in and build. Mm -hmm. Do you get a sense that it, it's a double-edged question? First part of the question is, is Brampton set up for potential growth? Because you need to have the infrastructure in place before investors or, or developers are going to come and say, we want to build. And on the flip side, mm -hmm. you can't put the infrastructure without the developers saying that they want to build. That's so right. In Brampton, do you get a sense that developers are wanting to come to the table, but the infrastructure may not be there? Or is the infrastructure there? You're just waiting for the economic sort of headwinds to level itself out so developers can start picking up and actually mm -hmm. building those houses that people need. Yeah. So this this uh, response is a little bit more complicated than, than the first one. So some of the infrastructure is there <laughs> uh, and some of it is not. Uh, so, so what's interesting about Brampton is because we're part of the broader region of Peel, a lot of our wastewater infrastructure and uh, other infrastructure that's needed to support such growth has been shared, a shared cost between Caledon, Brampton, and Mississauga. Mississauga, of course, was the first to grow out or to build out. Um, and in the meantime, some of that infrastructure was being built to accommodate Brampton's growth. But, I, but now um, we're kind of hitting growth targets that go beyond our original projections of what that infrastructure was supposed to withhold. So I think that our challenge is, is yeah, we have some of that infrastructure and not all. And in fact, last year in the P region of Peel budget, we had to top up our budget to accommodate more water or wastewater infrastructure in the amount of $30 million on a high intensification corridor in the city of Brampton called Queen Street. Um, so we're trying our best to, to um, accommodate and have that infrastructure, but of course it costs a lot of money. Uh, and, and the property tax time cannot pay for all of it, which is why it's awesome to see the federal government in some ways step up to make sure that that happens, that infrastructure is there to accommodate the housing. Now, are housing applications coming in in Brampton? They are. They are. We're hitting record numbers and we're doing what Doug Ford likes to say, cutting the red tape as much as we can and compressing the amount of time it takes to apply to get these applications through. But I'll tell you that there are applications in Brampton that were approved three, four years ago sometimes five years ago, and there's not been a shovel in the ground. So some of the developers are sitting on these applications and at the same time, taking up the capacity or the holding of that infrastructure allocated to them. Um, and so something needs to be, something definitely needs to be done. Uh, and I know that some of it is out of the control of government and some of it is market related as well. I want to turn because we could talk about housing probably for like a full hour if we had oh, to. Yeah. But 
I want to go back to the original question and you said safety is a concern. Before I ask this question, I want to make sure I get this on the record. You're not saying Brampton Brampton is not a safe place to live, right? No, no. Brampton and the region of Peel, when you actually look at the statistics from around the country, is actually one of the safest places to live. Um, I think that I, I, I understand that. I just wanted to make sure I put that on the record yeah, because I guarantee sure. there's going to be someone who's going to yell at me and say, <laughs> what do you mean Brampton's not a, a safe place to live? And it's like, no, I just wanted to make sure that the counselor had time to <laughs> say that. Um, crime. Patrick Brown, your mayor, has been doing fantastic work. It seems like he's on uh, CP24 all the time, and it seems like he's out and trying to tackle this issue. This is a federal issue as well. This is a provincial issue. Do you get a sense around the council table that all three levels of government are finally working together to tackle the safety issue around what's going on in Brampton? And I say Brampton and the greater Peel region and even yeah. the greater GTAH area. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, thank God, finally, finally, they're all working together now to understand that, you know, it doesn't matter what postal code you live in or where the boundaries cross between Brampton, Vaughan, Toronto, Etobicoke, Mississauga, Caledon, you know, you name it, Halton region, this issue of auto theft and organized crime impacts all of them. Um, and uh, some have... Uh, more are more targeted. Some cities are more targeted than others. Um, but at the end of the day, seeing the municipal government and the provincial government, the federal government with their task forces and all the police working together, and then the border security folks, it is great to see. And it, it proves a point that when all levels of government usually, usually kick-started by the municipality. <laughs> but when all levels of government work together to solve these problems, we can actually get things done. I want to flip the original question on its head because I don't always like talking about the negative things that are going on in municipalities. What's the thing you're proud about when it comes to Brampton? I, well, I, I'm super proud of how diverse and incredible our community is as a whole. Um, but I know that you have a flair for tourism. And Which we're going to talk about in two seconds tourism. here, so don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I would say that most recently, one of the proudest things I am about Brampton is that we are claiming our title as the cricket capital of Canada. And we have been making significant investments and a lot of smiles on people's faces <laughs> when it comes to the cricket fields, the cricket pitches, the youth cricket programs, the youth cricket fields, the tape ball, the cricket batting cages, the, the lit, beautiful premier fields, both of which are in my ward. And I'm also chair of community services. So the, the stuff we're doing on cricket in particular in Brampton and claiming the title as the cricket capital of Canada is certainly one thing I'm very proud of. So you you, you broached the subject and I, le I like to play in that sandbox and that is tourism. <laughs> we often hear about the things that the province and the federal government likes to talk about when it comes to tourism, but I think municipalities do have a role in playing into the tourism file. And it's a big economic driver that a lot of people don't talk about for you. And we talked about the cricket capital of Canada being Brampton. Well, what are the hidden gems in your community? What's the thing you look at and you go, you know what, if someone comes to Brampton, they need to see this part of Brampton, not the what the province says to see, but what I as a counselor says you need to see. What's that for you? So there, there are a couple of them. Okay. Actually, there's three. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm so proud of my city. So, so the first one is not actually in my ward, but I was actually just there making an announcement with the federal government. Um, and that is Chinkuzi Park. Chinkuzi Park in Brampton is similar to even better, but smaller to like a central park in New York. We have not only a playground and a splash pad and a ski hill and a tubing hill, um, but we also have tennis courts, a track and field. Uh, we have huge concerts and events there at Chinkuzi Park. We have a pond where you can do paddle boating. Um, there's, we have a petting zoo. We have rides. We have a train. 
Uh, we have mini golf, a Jurassic mini golf course. So Chinkuzi Park, uh, especially in the summer, also in the winter, is a fantastic gem in the city of Brampton, but it is not in my ward. What is also not in my ward, <laughs> what I'm very proud of, is Gage Park. Uh, so Gage Park is nestled in the downtown of Brampton. It's currently under construction, but it is very well known for the beautiful ice path um, that is available to folks in the winter, but it's one of our most oldest parks in the city of Brampton with a beautiful old tree canopy. We also have incredible events there as well. Now, the final thing that I'm very proud of, which is in my ward. I was going to say, the there better be one in your ward <laughs> here, counselor. <laughs> there are two, Etobicoke Creek Trail. So the Etobicoke Creek Trail runs all the way from Caledon all the way down to um, the lake through Mississauga. It is a beautiful trail uh, with not only a robust ecosystem with deer and coyote and other animals and fox and everything else, but a beautiful trail that you could bike or you could scooter or you could walk or run through from Caledon through to uh, the bottom of Mississauga. And it runs directly through my ward in, in Ward 1. The final thing I'm proud of, which is the tourism thing, is the Rose Theatre and our arts and culture scene and Garden Square. So the Rose Theatre, we, we completely rebranded what it's uh, positioned as. It's now called Brampton on Stage. And, it, and in our theater, it's it's uh, one of the best acoustically sound places and venues to have a concert. We have music theater. Um, we have incredible artists who actually perform from local artists to national artists. Um, and that's a beautiful place. And Garden Square is just outside where we have tons and tons of festivals, especially during the summer. Can I ask if Point of Order has uh, played on that theater? <laughs> <laughs> point of order has not yet although uh point of order our next gig so point of order is my band i i, I guess you have heard about that by the way point of order the name was inspired by a council meeting just so you know because <laughs> <laughs> everyone it, we were kind of fighting and everyone was calling points of order and people lost track of whose point of order is on what anyway um, yes, so the, the next gig is actually uh, going to be Hockey Night in Brampton, which is a huge fundraising event that the mayor hosts every single year in August, right after AMO. And we have it at the CAA Center. We have celebrity hockey players who actually come in. Last year, we had John Tavares from the Maple Leafs, the captain of the Leafs, show up to that game. And Point of Order ends up playing. We play for the VIP reception afterwards. So that's going to be our next gig, I think. There you go. Um I'm gonna, I was going to ask you my final question, but I have to sneak in this question because we have people who listen to the show who are not municipal leaders, but who are thinking about putting their name on the ballot. What advice would you give a potential new council candidate or someone interested in getting involved and in putting their name on the ballot that you wish you would have had prior to putting your name on the ballot back in 2018? Mm. So uh, the advice that, that I would give is um, be prepared that, you know, the, when you start making these choices and, and you start rising and taking the lead on, on different things, that all of that good work, um, all of that hard work also sometimes causes a lot of attention and negative attention, people trying to hold you down. Um, and people possibly trying to spin things um, and misinform what your intentions are. And my advice would always be, my advice would be to um, always just be authentically yourself, regardless, because people will criticize you anyway. Um, and so they might as well try to criticize your authentic self, because there is integrity in that. Um, and, and if you maintain your integrity in being your authentic self, then it shouldn't bother you too much. <laughs> they can't take that away from you. They cannot yeah. take away you, the integrity in your authentic self, I guess is what I'm trying to say. No one can take that away. I appreciate the answer there. So my final million dollar question, we started by talking about yourself. We're ending by talking about the city of Brampton. 
In your opinion, what makes the city of Brampton such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? It has certainly changed since I was growing up um, as a kid in the 1980s, watching all of the houses get uh, built up, and now we're looking at condos going up. What makes it so unique, Chris, is um, even when I first moved into to Brampton when I was quite young, I think I was uh, only five years old at the time, the level of acceptance and the embracing of people and culture and diversity um, is absolutely like no other. We have flag raising, celebrating every single culture around the world at the city of Brampton almost every single day. Festivals, events, embracing various cultures. And we have an incredible mayor and council who has no room for hate in any type of form in the city of Brampton. And we defend that uh, at the council table and as a city corporation wholeheartedly. And so people feel like uh, welcomed, they feel like they belong, and they feel like they're at home when they're in Brampton because of the level of acceptance and diversity all throughout the entire city. Councillor, I want to thank you so much for taking 45 minutes out of your busy schedule and sitting down and talking to me. It feels like we only chatted for 20 minutes, but it seems like we've crammed in a lot of things in 45 minutes, and I feel like we just scratched the surface. <laughs> so I appreciate you taking time and doing this interview and talking about yourself and talking about the great work the city of Brampton's doing. So thank you so much. Thank you, Chris, and thank you for the work that you do to really uplift and showcase what municipal government and local elected officials, what we do in our communities. Thanks so much for tuning in for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our great conversations that we have coming up. And when we return for season seven of the Cross Border Interviews in September later this year. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, but as always, just keep talking, guys.